the political philosopher Hannah Arendt analyzed totalitarianism, fascism, and the possibilities of democracy. Her work is urgently relevant today, but no one should take pleasure in that fact. It's relevant because of the rise of populism, neo-fascism, and threats to democracy, to free speech, to a free press, to reason, and to thinking itself. But Arendt also insisted in the preface to a collection of her essays in 1968 that even in the darkest of times, we have the right to expect some illumination. I sat down with the philosopher Richard Bernstein, who teaches at the New School in New York City, and who first met Arendt in 1972. He told me about this first meeting, which he considered one of the most intellectually exciting and also erotic meetings in his life, and why she's such an important thinker today. He explains her political philosophy, her work, and makes it not relevant, but actually comprehensible to anyone who wants to listen. Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. No, this is not cabaret, it's Think About It, a podcast about the power of ideas and how language can change the world, with Uli Baer. I'm really happy to have you here. So, Professor Richard Bernstein, big thank you for coming today. Yes. It's really great to have you. You've just published a short book, Why Read Hannah Arendt Now? Mm. You've done a lot of other books on American pragmatic philosophers, on Dewey, on continental philosophers. And I wanted to start out by asking you what motivated you to write the books and ask a question, why read Hannah Arendt now? Where are we now? Right. Why does her long work right. deserves to be not just reread, but we can think with her? Yeah. Let me say something in a preliminary way, and then I'll answer the question of how I came to meet her. I yeah. met her in, actually in April of 1972. At that time, I was teaching at a liberal arts college, Haverford College, and I was not really interested in Hannah Arendt at that point. As a matter of fact, I was really quite hostile. I was hostile because when I read some of the things that she had to say about Marx and Hegel, I thought it was just off the wall. <laughs> and I was much more interested in the Frankfurt thinkers and so, but it was a colleague of mine who invited me, her, to give this a talk. And actually, the talk she gave was the lying in politics, this very famous talk. The yeah. talk lying in politics. Well, lying in politics is the talk that she gave at Harvard. But she said when she came to Harvard, she wanted to meet me. I hadn't the slightest idea why she wanted to meet me. He, and when I can even remember, we met in a place called the Harvard Hotel at 8 o'clock. And the reason she wanted to meet me is that the editor of an early book I wrote called Praxis of Action was a friend of us had given her it to her. She wanted to tell me how much she appreciated and liked the book. My mindset... You were ready and defensive. Yeah, I was already... <laughs> and that night, believe it or not, we talked from 8 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the morning. And one of the things that I've dedicated to her, I've said that it was both agonistic in the sense of argument yeah. and erotic in the sense of a very strong personal attraction. Remember, I'm just at the beginning of my career in my 40s, and she's in the 60s. But that we became really close friends. What did she like in that book of yours? She liked that I was trying to do, now this is interesting, it tells something that a lot of people don't know about Hannah, her generosity. In the book on Praxis of Action, I have only one little footnote to Hannah Rent. Now she could have taken the attitude, well I, after all, I mean I've written about action and human condition, how come you didn't discuss that? That was not of, of any interest. She thought I was trying to do something fresh and original. And, and what's the argument in the book on what is action for in, you? In is, the book... Because you're I, a philosopher by training, yeah, right? Now, in the book, I dealt with the themes of praxis and action in four traditions, in Marx, in existentialism, in American pragmatism, and analytic philosophy. Okay. But it, at that time, it went against the whole spirit of what American philosophers were doing. I was frequently said, you can't write a book and we talk about Marx and talk about analytic philosophy in the same book. Right. Well, but, you know, I was stubborn or strong-headed enough that yeah. I did it. 
And in fact, I'll tell you something that then I'm going to answer your question. She wanted me to come to the new school on the basis of that book in 1972. It didn't really work out, and that was because the new school was going through a terrible period and financially and chaotic. Okay. And I was not inclined to come to New York City from Pennsylvania with a four young children and a wife. The 70s was not, New York was not such attractive a place. But when it didn't work out, she wrote me a wonderful letter uh, about, you know, that she had recently read the book and she reread it, she used it in her teaching, huh. and found that there were those who were very enthusiastic and very hostile to it. And then she said, I know this from my own experience. Hmm. All uh -huh. academic writing, left, right, and center, is conservative by nature. Nobody wants to hear something new. <laughs> uh, I show that to all my students. And she said all academic writing all is academic inherently writing conservative. It is inherently conservative in this and way. And she's at this point teaching at the new school. She was teaching at the new school. Regularly. Yes. She also right. has these guest positions. Okay. Yes. She was hired regularly in the graduate faculty in 67 right. and right. she was teaching. So what did she think was new in your book? She must I have found something to, new. She was actually thought that I had a very fresh an interesting interpretation of Marx and Hegel okay. in the book. Uh, there were other aspects that she, I, but I think that the idea that I was not in convention, I was not identifying with any kind of school, right. that I was really trying to, that is, I think, what appealed to her. And then we became good friends. I mean, good friends in the sense that we met, so she invited me for dinner, but we always argued. You know, really, that yes, was her mode of argued, engaging, really, you know, that was what she wanted. Even in our correspondence, how to translate the word Geist, you know. Really? I was but, arguing that you, it's better to use the term spirit in English than mind. Right. And so it was a wonderful friendship. In fact, in a curious way, I'm not answering, and then I will ultimately get to the question. She was responsible for the publication of my second book, which, uh, the, not the book I wrote after that, called The Restructuring of Social and Political Philosophy because she asked me when I was going to the new school, when she wanted me to, what are you working on? I had just applied for an NEH grant. Okay. So I had a proposal. She took that proposal and showed it to her editor, William Jovanovich, who was the head of Holcourt Brace, and okay. was very close. And the next thing I know that I'm invited, Hannah asked me what I'd like to have go to uh, a Sunday brunch at his estate. So I met Hunter in New York, and we drove up with Mary McCarthy. He, right. And this was all very lovely. I was a bit naive. I thought, this is nice. I'm meeting all these people. Nice brunch here. And at the end of the brunch, she says, I'm going to publish your next book. Oh, you didn't realize you were pitching a project. No. You thought you were just having brunch. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and actually, Hawk Race did publish the nice. book, book, and it was so the intervention of Hannah. And it says and, something interesting that she's got you in touch with the publisher of non-academic books. Yes, that's right. What I think is the uptake of this story yeah. is Hannah could be very opinionated. And if she thought somebody was stupid or she didn't like them, yeah. she didn't hesitate. Yeah. But Barry is the fact that, look, I was not a known intellectual. I was a young person. That made no difference. She thought I was trying, that I was doing interesting things. Right. And so she was sort of generous and friendly and helpful. And, and it became a conversation. And it became a conversation. And indeed, that's when I had to sit down and read really her work seriously. Because oh, was there was the first conference ever on Hunter Rent was in 1972 in November, the following November, yeah. uh, after I, I had met her. So I sat down, read her work, and I gave a paper. That con and she would, came to it. She was yeah. at the conference. And that was also interesting. Because, you know, people giving things, naturally right. going to say nice things about her. She wasn't interested in that. Right. She was interested in the issues. That's what she wanted to discuss. It's interesting, there's a, what you said, there's a generosity. Yes. And you also form a lot of, there's a kind of impatience with wasting time, with academic debates. I think there is, I mean, one of the illusions, you know, Hannah Arendt is, I still haven't answered your question, but I will. Hannah Arendt was... You know, people associated with the new school, and she did teach at Princeton, and she did teach at Berkeley, but she was never an academic. Right. She really was an independent thinker. Yeah. And even when she taught, it's only in 67, after all, she was born, that she really took a regular position. Right. 
And even there, she would take off time to write. So she was always, you know, writing and thinking and lecturing, but never, she actually thought the American academic institutions were a very funny and peculiar institution. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. She was invited, I think, to be a visiting professor at Princeton. She was the first woman. She got publicly interviewed. How does it feel to be the first woman professor at Princeton? And she said, I don't know. I've always been a woman. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> no, she didn't. That's another question she really liked to answer. She got asked that several yeah. times, right? So in writing this book, I've been dealing with Hannah's work. Uh, sometimes I'm very critical. Mm -hmm. There are many things that I'm very critical of. In it, and I've written uh, a number of papers, but it's it's always been in conversation and engagement mm -hmm, with her. Mm -hmm. And I did write this book on Hunter Went and Jewish Question. Right. And as you well know, particularly after the Trump election, I mean, there was just this interest in her. And now, till today, right. she's all over the social media. There are articles. Oh, the books are selling more than any, right. anything else. And the editor of Polity told me that there was a small... So this, so this book was written for a very specific audience. Okay. It was written for the people who are not necessarily academics and so forth, but who've heard the name right. and really want to know something about her. It's a book without footnotes and right. scholarly apparatus, and it's meant to be read in an evening or a day or two right. Right. or on a plane from here to L.A. Yeah. Well, and it tells a story. Yeah. I think there's a yeah. story of how she becomes a political thinker and what it means to actually be politically engaged. I've seen you give a talk somewhere else where she said, all of our thought, all of our thinking has to be rooted in the incidents of lived experience. Yeah. She's now such a guide for everybody. People yeah. turn to her and say, she can give yeah. us some wisdom. That is not her approach. She said, I can help you maybe no, that's clear. think through what is going she on. She would be scandalized by the <laughs> idea of a Redians. Right. You know, no. it is certainly true. And, you know, people will speak about her theory of evil, her theory of politics. That's already on the wrong side. I mean, if you really take her seriously, she is engaged in the project of thinking and rethinking, and coming at something from one point of view, from another point of view, and you have to take her in that way. I mean, in the beautiful portrait of Socrates in an essay called Thinking of Moral Consideration, she raises the question, how do you teach someone to think? You infect them with your own perplexities. You yeah. infect them with your, your own, own perplexities. perplexities. And I think yeah. that that's the way it is. I mean, you're not going to find solutions to things. I mean, it's perplexities and problems that she's always seen. Do you think she had the confidence that everybody has that capacity? Yes. Everybody could, yes. could, could no, be no, no, taught no. or activated yes, or encouraged. Yes, no, I mean, that is extraordinarily important for her because she takes up the topic. She was always interested in thinking, but thinking is not knowledge, and thinking is like, she uses a beautiful metaphor of Penelope's web. You have to weave it and then unweave right. it again. And she would say that there are no dangerous thoughts. All thinking is dangerous because it's always... Questioning is always loosening And it's up. interesting that this is yeah. a central concern for her. Yeah. What is thinking? It's not technical, no. problem-solving, puzzle-solving. Well, it starts from there that then she says, what is the political space? But individuals, we have a capacity to think. Yes. We also have a capacity for thoughtlessness, yes. for actually using she, concepts that we've inherited. As the way she once put it very sort of cryptic, thinking is dangerous but non-thinking is more dangerous. Non-thinking is more dangerous. <laughs> Tell yeah. me something, what do you think she meant by non-thinking? As I say, you can find the theme of thinking in her right. earliest work on. It becomes more thematic as a result of the Eichmann book. Yeah. Because her hypothesis is that Eichmann lacked a certain capacity to think. Now, people find that mystifying. I mean, Eichmann was intelligent. He could manage things beautifully. He was a wonderful bureaucrat. <laughs> But thinking for her is, in that context, is having the capacity to really be imaginative and to understand things from another point of view. In this context, you know, her reflections on Kant's reflective judgment were very important. So there is that aspect of thinking, in, and so that's what it is. She asked herself, what is it that he lacked, right, you know, right. that is her own suggestion, and that then led her to a much more systematic um, trying to understanding. She loved the English expression, 
stop and think. <laughs> you know, when you stop and think, and take, how few people. Like check in with yourself. Yes. So she kind of says academic work doesn't really produce novel. Let's just keep that on no. the side. And to go back to the, yeah. so she writes the book on totalitarianism where there's right. a large section on that people slowly are taught not to think but accept stories and yes. concepts and yes. paradigms that are given right. to them and they see themselves in that way. It's not yes. like they see the outside world, but they start seeing themselves, let's say, as resistors or complicit. Yes. She goes to Jerusalem to uh, document the trial for the New Yorker. Yeah. And she's a journalist, really, and there's a certain, when you read the letters, there's a certain kind of mixture of excitement and saying, I'm just going to report on this. And yeah. then something happens to her when she witnesses this trial, because yes. Eichmann is on the stand, and he produces enormous, absurd amounts of documentation and right. justification and reasoning and explanations. None of this for her is then thinking. No. Right? In fact, this is what, he, what he most impressed her in the testimony, that he is so caught up in cliches, in bureaucraties, that he can never break out of it. She was fascinated, not only his language at the report, but she read, all the, you know, he, there was this whole pretrial thing, as if it's almost a machine just doing and, and preventing him. Right. From really sort of thinking. So that's but, really, but as you said yeah. before, very successful. Someone can learn how to no, speak no. in I a mean, very can, more than more than more than successful. I mean, after all, he was a genius in figuring out transport how to get people to the death camps. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. So say something about that. What she experiences, she's is witnessing somebody who is very good at explaining yeah. and explaining. Yeah. And she wants to say there's another way of thinking, to stop okay. and think. So what is this other way? That but the can... point is to stop and think, to reflect on what you're doing and doing to question your biases and your prejudices. It's so interesting. In the essay on thinking and more, I think when she says, I'm going to look for an exemplar of the thinking that everybody can engage in, an exemplar of Socrates. She says, a citizen who's not a philosopher. Yeah. And it's yeah. the questioning. She takes up the metaphors that Plato uses, that he is a gadfly, right. that there's a reality that he brings, but most of the ideas that he brings out in other people, she says, are wind eggs. Right. And then he has the capacity to paralyze. It's like a stingray. And yeah. what she means by that is not that thing, but to touch you in a way yeah. that really sort of infects you in some ways. Right. Yeah. When she talks about Socrates and Plato, yeah. they become yeah. quite important yes. in the context of what independent thinking could be for a person versus my personal opinion. Yeah. Which is, and between Socrates and Plato, there's this, you have an opinion, I have an opinion, we all yeah. have opinions. Let me say this. Hanu is tremendously erudite. But there are ways in which when she speaks about figures, philosophers, from an academic point of view, you can say, wait a minute, she doesn't have it quite right. <laughs> but she thinks about them creatively. Yeah. In other words, if you take her on Kant on reflective judgment, any student who took a course in Kant at the graduate course would say, this isn't really what Kant is doing. It's not so interesting. It's a little bit like Carol Bloom's idea of systematic misreading. Right. What is brilliant is what she's doing with it. So let's say what Bloom yeah. means maybe is that you are touched by what the person says, yes. but you also activate something in that, in, which is now a corpus and a right. name, and there's right. Kant, and you can right. get Kant right. She would right. say, I'm not about to get right. It's not no, that, quite that the criteria, right? That is a perfect description. So what does she get from Kant well, from she, these that, people? I mean, from I think Socrates it's a stroke of genius to see that what Kant was doing with aesthetic judgment, yeah. she sees as essentially political. That's the key to understanding political, because you need a form of judgment which is not simply deductive, not simply determinate, where you're f facing the particular and looking. So it is a kind of brilliant insight and a brilliant appropriation. Mm -hmm. I want to get back to the Plato because she frequently stresses the difference between Plato and Socrates. Right. She has a quarrel with philosophy. I mean, she thinks that what the tradition of philosophy from Plato to Hegel and Marx is not really interested in politics as his practice, but imposing philosophic standards right. on it. Right. And in that sense, it distorts politics, because politics is, for her, the realm of opinion, of doxa, of testing things that in the public space, yeah. in which 
rational truth or philosophic truth is not appropriate. But that's interesting. So it actually, yeah. she has a quarrel with Plato. Yes. Who hesitates but says, ultimately, we must find the truth. And she says that could become a tyrannical exactly. imposition. Exactly. She even so, has an expression at times, the coercion of truth, yeah. you see. But it's interesting. She opens up this category of truth. Yeah. But to something else, what you said, there's opinion. We all have opinions. Political space for her is not to find the truth with a capital T. Right. Right. There's a right. conflict. Right. Although we would think today, I'd like to have the truth. I'd well, like to not live in a country of lies. <laughs> Arendt is a great distinction maker. Sometimes people find it frustrating because she's using words in unusual way. Right. Take, for example, action. Well, I mean, we're acting all the time. Right. Action is something really quite specific for her in terms of public action. And so you have to be sensitive. Mm -hmm. But what she's trying to elicit, I mean, much of my book is an attempt, not only is one of my favorite patches of how all thinking is rooted in experience and has to be brought back to experience, mm -hmm. but one of the things that makes her, I think, Rent such an interesting and exciting thinker. I mean, when I teach a Rent, always there are some students who come alive, and there is a reason for that. Mm -hmm. Arendt is, you could agree or disagree with her. And she was always controversial, <laughs> not just in Eichmann, all the way through her life, which she wrote about Breck, which she wrote about segregation. She had that capacity to touch nerves mm -hmm. that people feel strong, and that's part of her provocativeness. But she is an exemplar of a person who is tremendously sophisticated in philosophy, mm -hmm. in political science, in literature, mm -hmm. but using it all the time to deal with real problems. Right. Problems of refugees, problems of statelessness, problems of the, lying. The race problem in America. And, and race, The problem yeah. of justice. The and Eichmann trial is ultimately for her a problem of yes. who can pass judgment on what happened in one country yes. a long time ago. Exactly. But what? also so that she is the paradigm of what many people think an intellectual should be. And we're academics really are. Yeah. You know, yeah. we really are the kinds of people who are taking what we know and applying it to the vital issues of our time. So when you said she uses words sometimes against the grain or yes. against established usage, right. when she talks about the truth, she says yeah. Plato knows of this risk that yeah. the philosopher's truth will yeah. be a coercion or imposition right. on the life of people in the world. Yeah. And Socrates says, I have to elicit not my just personal opinion, but my capacity to make sense of myself. Well, this is where you have to I sort of appreciate, for example, what she's doing with a concept like opinion or mm -hmm. anything. Opinion for her is not just my opinion. Right. Opinion is something that is really sort of tested in a public space where you come up with it, but it never makes the claim to any kind of absolute certainty or absolute right, truth. Right. Truth is relevant to opinion. It's got to be based on it, but you have to make a distinction. And she sees it as an enormous... Now, I think what we haven't introduced that is, was so important for her in the lying is she wants to make the distinction between rational truth, yeah. that's like truths of mathematics, or what she will sometimes use the truths that Plato are claiming that we, when we know the forms, and factual truth. Okay. And the reason that factual truth is the problem, the main problem for us today, is because it's contingency. Any factual truth could be otherwise. Therefore, you have a greater capacity to destroy it. And she thinks of the rewriting of history. Right. She thinks, and that lying for her is a deliberate attempt to destroy factual truth. So in this interesting yeah. essay, which yeah. now has this kind of renaissance, he yes. said 1972, it's truth. Yeah in politics. Yeah, she yes. says, lying has always been part of politics. Actually, opening is really yes. startling. She yeah. says, people lie in politics. I mean, yes. we are living right. in America right now, and our attorney general just lied to Congress. And she yeah. said, well, lying is always part of it. No one has ever had a problem with that. Yeah. But something shifts, what you just said, when right. factual truth is not just we negotiate, and ultimately, right. ultimately we know to negotiate right. and come maybe to an agreement, tenuous yeah. or not. But she says there's something else going on. And this is after the Pentagon Papers. Yes. She said, what is introduced? You make a point of this. She is always very interested in what's the new thing? What's yes. What's novel here? Well, one of the things that was, I want to make two points. Sometimes I say I want to make two points. You make, not to be four. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> or some we can more, do that. More. <laughs> she wrote that essay. She was provoked to write that essay after the Eichmann book. 
because she thought that there were all kinds of lies. So just give me one sentence. The Eichmann book caused a fury of responses. Yes. Because yes. what was the main argument that people made? What was, well, wrong? I what think was that, wrong with that book? I think that there were many, many things that were wrong, many kinds of objections. It was primarily an American Jewish community that reacted strong. There are a few pages in which he discusses the what were called the Judenrat, the Jewish councils, which was an issue that nobody really wanted to publicly discuss. The truth is that what the Nazis did in the ghettos and places is get various Jewish leaders to organize their own kinds of communities. Mm -hmm. Now, the truth is that this is a very complex issue. There were members of Jewish councils who committed suicide rather than follow right. Nazi right. orders. Right. There were others who used it for power and aggrandizement and so forth. But I think that then and still, people like to think in two simple categories. There are victims and perpetrators. They're the right. bad guys and the rest are innocent. Right. Right. And I think that what Arendt says, first of all, it isn't the truth. You have to understand the extent to which successful totalitarian can get people to be their own kind. So we know that most of the dirty work in the concentration camps were done by members in the concentration, even running the gas chambers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this, I think in the 19, it was, an, scholars knew about this and people who had function in them, but it was not something to be discussed. And then she's writing it in the and New Yorker. And then she just mentions it, and that was explosive, because that was then interpreted, she's blaming the victim, which she was not doing. So she so, was accused of blaming the victim yes. and of and, being and, too soft, because the banality of evil is the yeah. catchphrase, and she yeah, says and, you are and, downplaying right. the perpetrator. Right, and that was, again, because that really is a, a, an enormous distortion. I yeah. mean, when she says, I quote her, the deeds were monstrous, right. but the man was not a monster. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we still yeah. think that way. Yeah. We still think in terms of our own politics, of how we thought of Osama bin Laden. They are the personification of evil, just right. like in the bad guys in Western movies. Right. That's right. Bush used that analogy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the deeper point of Arendt, and even in that book. If you want to understand evil after totalitarianism, you can't understand it in that way. And in you have to understand how people who could be just normal, successful, middle, right. but put in certain situations, do terrible could do things. Terrible monstrous things. things. Yeah. So that is actually, and then so this the is banality has, doesn't refer to the what was done. It refers to the the set, the mental set of a person. You know, look, I. I send cattle, I send humans to their right, death. Right. What's the difference? That's right. what it, where it is. When you get into that kind of, of, and people think that way. She says another wonderful statement. Most of the evil in this world is not done by people who think they're doing evil. And the they don't really something. stop and think about yeah. what they're doing. Or they're doing something. But people don't want to hear that. That's interesting. I yeah. mean, you know, Eichmann had to be a monster. Eichmann had to be sadistic. Hmm. No, no. Uh, Eichmann was embodied anti-Semitism from Pharaoh to the present. So do you but think the criticism the, of the book is about the argument? It's also about the tone. Yes. Because she uses, and you mentioned this in the yeah. book, she uses irony. Yes. Which in right. this context yeah. is very hard to stomach. Yes, and I, I think. And I think people words that you're using the wrong tone. But I think Hannah Arendt never shrunk away from using no. irony. <laughs> no. And she says something quite explicitly. She said, when she was reading it, she says this in the famous Gauss interview, that I laughed many times when I listened to him. Yeah. I myself do think that there are parts that she should have at least been more sensitive mm -hmm. to the fact that this is still a very painful time for Holocaust survivors, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know. Even, for example, in the beginning of the book, she's very critical of Ben-Gurion. You're not going to win friends. Ben Gurion was considered like, you know, a hero, Mandela at that time. You're not going to win friends when you begin a book and yeah, talk well, about his show trial. Right. Um, and I think she didn't even respect for the feelings of survivors or their experiences. She thought well, there was a piety we can't afford. She yes, says at some well, point, we can't afford any pieties here. We have to be just so clear. And she says, I have to just do this work. And I think she felt herself. Well, there's always, by the way, there is an interesting earlier fact that I 
discovered only much later. You know that Hannah Arendt, when she fled G Germany in '33, she spent the time in France. Right. And just before the Germans invaded France, the French authorities put all German emigres, that is mainly Jews, right. into internment camps. In fact, she once made this wonderful remark. She said, you know, we happen to be a new kind of people. The people we are, our enemies put us in concentration camps and our friends put us in internment camps. She says that and we refugees. But yeah. she was in Guru's, which was a camp for women near the Spanish border. And when the Nazis marched into France, there was a period of chaos, and she escaped from it. Yeah. The women who did not escape from there were ultimately sent to Auschwitz by Otto Feitman. Mm -hmm. So when she goes to Sean and says that I have to, I want to confront this and the thing, you might say at a much deeper level she, yeah. was this kind of knowledge that f by the grace of fate, right. she could have been sent to Auschwitz by yeah. Eichmann. There's this outrageous response, outraged response to Eichmann. Yes. And in another interview, she said, something shifted. She said, when we learned what happened there, something shifted. Well, that's not just about Eichmann. That's, yeah, that was that there was a period in the early 40s when they were hearing about the extermination, not just concentration camps. They didn't believe it. She didn't believe it at first. This is exaggeration. Mm -hmm. And then when it, that's when things shifted. When right. it came, this is already, I think, in early 42, this is something she said should not have happened. And yeah, yeah. this becomes a basis for what she says, that people can be declared to not have a right to exist on the planet. Yes. That must not happen. Well, like that's... She says it's outside of legal categories right. well, that and becomes, depriving them of their rights. And that's also fundamental to, I mean, one of the reasons why Arendt, I think, is... Let me say a little bit more generally what I tried to do in this book. I wanted to tell the story. I wanted to give a kind of range of her thinking. But she was extraordinarily perceptive about what she calls the darkness of the times. And the darkness does not refer just to totalities. It relates to lying, the denigration of truth, or that wonderful statement when, when in, um, in the name of moral uplifting, all truth gets denigrated to triviality. The most frightening sentence in the origins of totality, and it was a book she writes in the 50s, is she says, that totalitarian methods will well persist when totalitarian regimes fall. Hmm. We think of torture and genocide and the kinds of things. So when you see what's going on yeah. today, I mean, Honor would never say that we're living in a totalitarian society, but so many of the tendencies yeah. that she saw that ultimately crystallized yeah. Yeah. are with us today. Yeah. So she writes this essay in 72 yeah. after having gone through this experience of writing a book that was experienced as an outrageous provocation by so many. She was pretty isolated then in a way in some yes. circles, right, yes. in New York City. Yeah. So in 72 she takes us up to write about truth and politics. Yes. So there's a background because the, it right. starts out by on the Pentagon Papers right. and all that. Right. But right. what right. is she trying to... Well, I said, told you the immediate provocation was the Eichmann book, and now yeah. it, for Rent, you see, she wasn't just going to write the answer to her critics, yeah. but it raises deep issues about it. Indeed, now I think we haven't yet mentioned what I think is the most, how can I put it, revealing and scariest part of what she has to say, because she talks about lying as a form of action which is destructive, and she makes the point how successful it can be. She also makes a point about, in terms of propaganda, I mean, it's related to fact-checking today, that people are not interested in the facts. They want a story. They want a narrative, right. you know, <laughs> to speak to their anxieties and, and things, so that many liberals, I think, are sort of distressed. How come when we point out all the facts that are wrong, people are not interested? <laughs> she understood the propaganda, how it works. But she makes a further point, which is really, I think, she says it can come a point with a very distinction between truth and falsity, it gets lost. That's really, mm -hmm. and I sometimes think, not just in the Trump administration, but in what's happening with new authoritarianism, that's the scary thing. I mean, I really do think, I mean, it's my own personal opinion, this one form of lying, 
when you know you're lying. You know the, right. the truth, but there's a form of lying where you're not even aware. You don't know anymore. The thing, and that yeah. I think is a serious day, and I think we see this in our time. And she says the she second says part, that, yeah. then it becomes the reality. Yes. Right? People actually believe this is what happened, yeah. and they re keep on referring uh, to it. And uh, she says that is propaganda that's so effective that people are deprived of this capacity yeah. to stop and think. Oh, not only stop and think, <clears throat> but they don't even see that there's a <clears throat> distinction between truth and falsity. That's the sense in which she says that there's always been lying, is she means about diplomacy and secretness right. and not telling <clears throat> the truth. But what's new. Right. is the destruction of the very capacity, because after a, a traditional lie, you right. know the truth, and you're telling something which is right. not the right. truth. Right. Right. And, and, <laughs> and you're still making the distinction between truth and falsity. You're just using it for various purposes. Oh, so you're making the distinction and saying, you can still say, while you believe in a yeah. total falsehood, you say, this yeah. is false, this is true, so you keep on talking a language of yeah. truth no, and lying. No, no, I mean, I can, uh, Plato gives a good example, I mean, I can know that this is a horse, but I'm going to convince you it's a mule. Right. But I know it's a horse. Right. But what happens when you don't even see that anymore? Right. That's what's really dangerous. So in this essay, Truth yeah. in Politics, which has yeah. gotten some attention now again, yeah. she says the U.S. government is doing something different. Well, that, I think, is something that really uh, became very striking to her in, from the Pentagon Papers. The new form of lying, and it was image-making. Not only did the Pentagon Papers reveal that the government was systematically lying, but what yeah. were the reasons for perpetuating the war? It wasn't economic advantage. It wasn't the defeat of co communism. It was the image. America cannot be seen as losing a war. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When that begins to happen, and now she then talks about how much lie has got to do with image making. Right. And that, she thought, was a, a new form of lying. Do you think she would have a sense that that crisis was then averted when Nixon resigned? Does our country get back in order or on course well, at that point? She leaves us with an ambiguity. I mean, it's one of her perplexities. On the one hand, there's a very powerful argument that lying can destroy factual truth. On the other hand, but she ends it by defending the universities and the defending the vehicles. So there is the idea, it becomes a greater obligation for there still to be the truth seekers and people to stand up. She did think that the university is one of the last institutions where this could be done, and that's what it is. But you know, but you will see both. But yes, you could say, Johanna, yeah, that's important, it's crucial. But you're also giving an argument that it can be destroyed, and I think that's one right. of the perplexities she loses with. Well, I want yeah. to ask you something about this yeah. claim she makes about the universities. In this yeah. essay, she says yeah. the universities have to be actually a non-politicized space. Yes. Which she, this is, she is teaching in the universities yeah. in the late 60s. Yeah. And she's saying the universities are becoming politicized yeah. by outside forces. Yeah. She takes a very strong stance against black studies. Yes. Very controversial. Right. And basically says, what we would call affirmative action today, it's admitting unqualified students. Well, she does so, say that. So all of these saying. criticisms are about political yeah. events, right. but she wants to preserve something, and I'm curious whether this idea that there's a space that's not politicized, whether that's actually, you can maintain that. One of the other interesting statements about Hanna, at this conference in 1972, Hans Morgenthau asked her this question. So Hans Morgenthau, as you said, he's one of the people who resigned from the government, correct? Is no, no, no. Hans Morgenthau was actually a professor of political theory at... And I think he no, wasn't... He did. Well, he did. He, he was in the administration in the right. government, right. And, right. and he and resigned, resigned from the government and then became a professor. And, but right. he was a very good friend. Yeah. And he said to her, in, this, in almost this language, because I was there, Hannah, what are you? Are you conservative? Are you a liberal? Oh, where do you stand? Right. And this is the way she answered. She said, you know, the people on the left accuse me of being conservative. The people on the right think I'm a kind of radical. In effect, she says, I couldn't care less. It's the thing she says that's next that I thought was so interesting. And you know, Hans, I don't think that the primary issues of our time are going to be answered in those terms. Okay? Now, there are passages in Arendt where you, I mean, if you want to, 
take it out of context. She's an elitist. She's a conservative. She doesn't understand what's going on in America. And there are other passages. After all, she's defending the revolutionary spirit. Right. She's certainly not a liberal that you could, and you know, she's a favors the council system that you could read the other. She really was independent, you see. And so I do think, though, and I think you can argue with her. I think that what she was afraid of, and I think that the institutions would become completely ideological. And if that mm -hmm. academic, mm -hmm. then they would lose their soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She also had rather, quote, a conservative attitude towards schools and young children. They should right. not be used for political purposes. Right, right, right. That's part of what she objected to in Little One, and that they have to be preserved. Politics is only when you are mature enough Let's uh, talk about that for it. a moment. She writes an essay on Little Rock on right. the integration of the schools, the desegregation after Brown versus right. Board of Education. Right. She takes a very strong sense yeah. and says the government should not impose integration. Uh, legally. Legally. Yeah, right. Okay. Right. From today's perspective, I think she's entirely wrong. It's quite interesting what she says, what you just said about school should not be a place where politics intervene. Right. I always thought this is the one time when Hannah Arendt is corrected, when Ralph Waldo Ellison right. writes and says, you don't understand yeah. the life of an African-American family in America. Yes. They're not using their kids, but their kids are already politicized in the system. Yes. And she says in response to this, this is one of the few, I don't know, you knew her, but it seems yeah. to be one of the very few moments where she but says- She admitted she was wrong. She was wrong, right. It's but the interesting thing, and this also tells something about Hannah. Ellison made this remark in an interview with Robert Penn Warren. She read it. She took the initiative to write to him Okay. And to said that I, you're right, I didn't really understand. Interesting. So that is, Interesting. In, I mean, you know, some people would then argue that it wasn't a public statement, but that tells something about Hannah, you know, that she could recognize. I mean, I think it's a terrible essay, and I think it's an essay in which many of the things that she objected to were illustrated. What I mean by that is she objected to people not really grasping the particular but imposing their own categories. This is the very time in which she's developing the categories of the political, the social, and the private, right. and they really do not work in this situation. Right. So that in a way, if there is an exemplar <laughs> in a rent of bad judgment, this is it. Of imposing her categories yes, onto the particular. that's right. I point this out in my book. But I would be much harder on this. I'm, you know, I, I did not get into the book, which is a major topic, is the way she draws the distinction between the social and the political, yeah. which I think ultimately, I mean, I've written criticizing right. her that right. this distinction right. just is really misleading. Yeah. Which I think was my question a little bit, yeah. that there could be a space that's not politicized. Well, young, yeah, that's right. To liken the form of discrimination where if I'm a Jew and I want to go to a hotel with their only Jews, right to discrimination of what's going on with blacks in America right. is, you know, to be blind to a tremendous difference. Well, yeah. the difference, yeah. is the difference maybe the question of power? So in some ways when well, she says, I want to go to a hotel and only be yeah. with other Jews, that's fine, yeah. so I have no problem with other people going to a hotel where there yeah. are no Jews. Just, yeah. well, if you're living in an unequal society where power is unequally distributed, yeah. then that's different. Well, that's, I mean, power in that sense. Yeah, you remember that, that power sense, yeah. also is a complex notion in a rent. Right. We can think of power in terms of power over yeah. and the forms of abuse, the suffering, the sacrifice right. that goes on. Which, the, To me, there's an enormous irony about this, and I'll tell you what the irony is. Because, you know, the origins of totalitarianism was not to be about totalitarianism. Right. It was to be about imperialism and racism. And she has a tremendous, she's very insightful yeah. about the origin of racism, particularly biological, is an ideology. So there are a lot of resources in Arendt right. where she could have been much more sensitive to what was going on. This she, argument, that's the first part of what becomes the origin of yeah. totality, it's an examination of right. racism, imperialism, anti Semitism. Right. And she says, it's not an irrational disgust or feeling, it's an ideology, yes. right? And this is actually quite interesting at what you're saying, right. that she understands it from the beginning in these political terms, yeah. and she wants to remove it from the sphere of this is just an emotional response that we can't right. do anything about. Right. 
She never so would accept that. That is actually yeah. a really important insight because right. we're living in a time right now where people say, oh, some people, they're just how they feel and this yeah. is just, we can't get rid no, of No, no, no. I, mean, I mean, so that's, here is where uh, you're right. And I don't think she would object to it. That you have to use a rent sometimes, I think, against the rent. Against herself, right. And I think there are people who are so enamored with her that they want to defend every word. Well, I've actually <laughs> had the experience where, as I say, from the 70s, I've been arguing with her. Yeah. But you know, it, when you have a, and this is what's so exciting, I think, about a rent and rereading her, I always see something new. Or yeah. something that is, I think, either insightful or wrong. And so it's, it is an ongoing conversation. It, yeah. When I look at the early works, there's this kind of analysis of totalitarianism, of political regimes, mm. of people losing their capacity to be independent free agents. Yeah. And then in the books on revolution, the early 60s, she writes about the French and the American Revolution. Yeah. It's a very celebratory book, I think, of America. Absolutely. I, I think it's really a turn to America. Yeah. Freedom becomes a category, and she says, and you quote this in your book, that people, even in the worst circumstances, can retain some capacity of their own, and I don't know what to call it, independence or agency or yeah. freedom. So how does that manifest itself well, in these dark times that she But does? you see, this is the play of darkness and illumination. I mean, the darkness is detecting tendencies in what you would sometimes call the modern world, the modern age, which haven't left us. And we're there, and to use the metaphor, she like crystallized into yeah. totalitarianism okay. and are still with us. The illumination is in terms of her deep conception about what we are as human beings, about the ideas of natality, that we have capacity to new beginning, and that the new beginning is really also the basis for a kind of freedom. And my reading of Arendt is that what really led to her positive conception of politics mm -hmm. was twelling of the horrors of totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. Because her deepest insight about totalitarianism is not just massacres and numbers of people that they're killing, but the attempt to destroy the human capacity for spontaneity to initiate. And that now becomes, you might say, the motif of the yeah. positive con thing, yeah. uh, conception that right. we are, each of us is born anew, and she, she liked to use the term net, natality, not just born, but second borning. There can always be, against all the odds, yeah, yeah. new beginnings. And that's the way she sees what the revolutionary spirit is. It's a new beginning, a new yeah. order, and that's what she says, celebrates. So in the end, you know, I end this book that I think the deepest theme in Rent is to take responsibility for our own kind of political lives. She would never give in to despair, to cynicism, right. to a logic of history. There's nothing that can be done, and done to being a mere spectator. There is always the possibility. She's not afraid to speak about it as a miracle, because you can't right. always predict why right. it is how yeah. people come together. What do you call contingency yes, or something? Yes, but that so. people can, that there are those moments, yeah. and that's what she sees, I mean, that's why she says, you know, she sees it in the revolution, she sees it in the Paris Commune, right. she saw it in Budapest in Hungary, again. right, you write about this. Yeah, the, people the, spontaneously coming together and really exercise, not only simply exercising, but demanding and engaging in a kind of freedom. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this kind of spontaneity yeah. and natality you said yeah. much earlier in teaching that people can be activated and they have this capacity yeah. which is asleep in us, yeah. and sort of what you said, it's a right. second being. Before I was interested in the rent, you know, I've been around for a long time. I mentioned to you earlier that I taught at Yale. I taught during Yale, at Yale. I went to Yale during the McCarthy period, you know, and it was a little bit horrifying because even then at Yale, most people were sympathetic with McCarthy. I couldn't believe it. Most people were Most sympathetic with McCarthy. Young students where now we have historical no, where, where was, <laughs> This is William Buckley had just graduated, and he wrote this, and I went to a debate in which he was there, and the audience was cheering him, and who, he was defending McCarthy. And you had the conception. And in the later 50s, I mean, you know, Eisenhower year, people had no interest in Then you saw the beginnings of the student movement opposing the House on American activities, the Hollywood 10, and I was there, witnessed yeah. that whole period. In fact, I was in Mississippi myself in 1964. Okay. Now, 
Uh, Arendt certainly was a great fan of the early civil rights movement, but that exemplified the idea of people getting off their fannies, yeah. deciding to do something, acting together, yeah. and making a difference. And that yeah. was classically Arendtian. But I actually think this is quite interesting when you see her and read accounts of her teaching. Yeah. She really cared about what students said. And as dismissive or impatient she could be with people who were stupid. Victor Early told me this anecdote. When she was at Yale, someone asked a question, and she said, next. Yeah, she I mean, didn't have time for the question. No, to be I mean, if you <laughs> read, particularly if you read her correspondence, you know, yes. reading her correspondence is really, <laughs> this is a lost art, but you know, this is the last generation of people who really wrote letters. Right, right. And what's fascinating, we have now published the letters to her husband, right. the letters to Heidegger, the letters to Mary McCarthy, and what I think is the most important collection, the letters to Jasper. Jasper, right. And you see the complexity of the, Sometimes you think you're reading a, a slightly different person in the way she... Right, right. And she was also complex in these relationships but with all these people. But in that, she's also very revealing about who she likes and who she doesn't, who she thinks is stupid and who right. she doesn't. Right. And, you know, it's a, sometimes it can be almost, not embarrassing, but very revealing. But if you yeah. said at the yeah. end of the 50s, so yeah. you go to, you're in the mid-50s, and then yeah. you see the student movement yes. is, is actually generating new ideas. Yes. And I think what you said, natality, spontaneity, newness, yeah. If you think about today's America, where people are turning to Arendt, I'm a little cautious to think, let's turn to these books that give us guidance. Arendt would have said, invent your own new uh, ways of doing it. I think that she would. I it think mean, use it a little. She never, in fact, I, at that first conference, there was a whole discussion of theory and practice, and people who were arguing that we right. theoreticians should have to give blueprints to direction. Right. And she resisted that. The thing she really did that only has to come. I mean, in some ways, she's a great defender of participants deciding the wrong right, right. Kind, kind of thing. But where I think it is relevant, you cannot turn to her rent for solutions. You can't turn to her, well, I'm going to read her and then I'm going to know what to do. <laughs> but you can turn to her for illumination because it is an argument. I mean, she begins the origins by saying, Progress and doom are two sides of the same coin. They're both superstitions. So she didn't believe in inevitable progress, but she also would reject something which I think is becoming very fashionable. The system is so corrupt. Right. Things are so awful. There is nothing that can be done. Yeah, right. She would right. resist that. Right. That is, you know, a kind of violation of our capacity yeah. to begin something new. And there's something, I think, yeah. when you read the letters and the things, the excitement she has by discovering a new idea. Yeah. But there's oh, a sort of, what yeah. you said, you, your first conversation was yeah. from eight till two, and they said there was an erotic charge. You see, yeah. there's an excitement. And All the encounters I had were, were memorable. I mean, the other thing that I find always perplexing, people sometimes say, well, she's cold, she's too rational. If there was a to me, an example of a passionate thinker right. and a person who loved and wanted to argue about ideas, right. it was clearly a rent. That's the, the way in which we encountered each other. Yeah. So even on a technical issue, how to translate Geist, you know, we you went were, back and forth on yeah, this. Yeah, right, you know? <laughs> I like the fact that you end the book on the, the councils during the Hungarian Revolution, yes. which is kind of spontaneous small kind of collective action. Well, that's, I mean, that's one of her favorite phrases was islands of freedom. Islands of freedom. Freedom. Yeah. freedom. And I also think that's very important today in terms of at least getting some illumination. Sometimes, you know, if we go back, uh, she didn't live to see the solidarity movement. I think she would have been very, I mean, after all, that's paradigmatic. Red, well, first of all, Adam Nishnik, who was one of the leaders of Solidarity, right. was reading Hannah Arendt when he's in prison and was inspired by it. Okay. Because why is it inspiring? Because power can grow. Empowerment can grow. Okay. People talking around. Yeah. And it is the Velvet Revolution started by people sitting around kitchen tables talking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. You know, and right, then right, it right. grows. And I think that is a message which I think is important for young people. You know, if you're going to say, how are we going to change the system? How right. are we going to change it? Right. That's the wrong way to think. But talk, but 
in small it's, ways. Yeah, it's the same in the civil rights movement. It's yes, in, in, well, in churches, yes. in living rooms, yeah, yeah. in community centers. Well, I think that's... And you yeah. never know, it can fail. There's no guarantee of success. <laughs> right, right, right. But this is the way, I think, right. uh, the revolutionary movements begin. Yeah. In, in a hot sense of revolution, the revolutionary spirit. Right. which you wanted to keep alive. With no guarantee, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. no guarantee. I like that. Yeah, you wrote an essay, I think, there. you yeah. quoted her, the thinking without a banister. There are yeah. no guardrails. Well, that, you I may think, run. is tremendously important for her. I mean, and it's part of a larger thing, I think, in the 20th century, that you have, I mean, we want guardrails. We want crutches. We want foundations. If we don't have that, anything goes. Right, right. And that's right. a run to sow yeah. against both. Both extremes. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, what thinking yeah. without bias is. Yeah. I think I want to thank you. Okay, good. Uh, this has been really fun. And you can see if I start get talking, I don't <laughs> stop. We could go on for it. <laughs> so if I may have you back sometime from eight till two or something like that. We wouldn't have done justice to our in an hour or so. It's okay. perfect. Thank you so much.